Two Disease by John Scott, read for LibriVox.org by Safa el -Mor. Disease, man's dread, relentless foe, fell source of fear and pain and woe. O say on what ill-fated coast they mourn thy tyrant reign the most, on Java's bogs or Gambia's sand, or Persia's sultry southern strand, or Egypt's annual flooded plain, or Rome's neglected waste domain, or where her walls Byzantium rears, and mosques and turrets crescent crowned, and from his high surrail the sultan hears, the wide propontis beating waves resound. I'll ask no more, our clime, though fair, enough thy tyrant reign must share, and lovers there, and friends complain, by thee their friends and lovers slain, and yet our avarice and our pride combine to spread thy mischiefs wide, while that the captive wretch confines, to hunger, cold, and filth resigns, and this the funeral pomp attends, to vaults where mouldering corpses lie. Amid foul air thy form unseen ascends, and like a vulture hovers in the sky. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dust and Disease by Lord Charles Reeves Read for LibriVox.org by Safa el -Mor. Of the wonderful things that lie round us concealed, how much have the true sons of science revealed? Good Faraday Long was the foremost of these, and now Tyndall has told us of dust and disease. If a long beam of light crosses through a dark room, it seems peopled with motes that shine bright in the gloom, but the gay dancing things that the gazer thus sees are in fact nothing better than dust and disease. Around us, above us, on all sides they float, they light on our skin and they slide down our throat. Though we don't feel or see them, yet go where we please, the atmosphere's laden with dust and disease. All the varying ills to which flesh is an air, all the foes of both body and mind may be there, lusts and fevers that burn, fears and agues that freeze, may be mixed in these atoms of dust and disease. All places alike these intruders infest, and tis thought that St. Stephen's is none of the best. Where faction and folly are busy as bees, there will always be plenty of dust and disease. In Westminster Hall, where the lawyers convene, these pestilent particles ever are seen. Where wrangling and wrath can be hired with big fees, you are sure of a market for dust and disease. The church should be free, but some heretics say, that at present the Vatican's in a bad way, and some other assemblies of learned DDs are perhaps not exempted from dust and disease. The dissenters are thought a peculiar people, more pious than those that sit under a steeple, but some one-sided views and intolerant pleas seem to savor a little of dust and disease. But what of the doctors? Are they without flaw? Is medicine more pure than religion or law? I suspect that some even with doctor's degrees love to kick up a dust and shake hands with disease. Diplomacy dresses her visage in smiles, to conceal all the better her treacherous wiles, but behind her false front a keen critic may seize on strong proofs of her traffic with dust and disease. Where fashion and luxury glitter like gold, but where beauty is bartered and honor is sold, though the surface shows little to shock or displease, yet beneath all is misery, dust, and disease. Some attacks on the lungs that of woe would be full are repelled by a filter of loose cotton wool, but a barrier of brass or a chevaux de frise won't exclude some descriptions of dust and disease. How long will these poison germs stifle the day? When will truth's blessed light shed a purified ray? When will Phoebus send heat or Favinus a breeze to destroy or disperse all this dust and disease? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 3 of Health, Disease, and Everything in Between. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Health, Disease, and Everything in Between by T. S. Eliot, Anne Kingsmill, Finch, et alia. The Spleen by the Countess of Winchelsea, Anne Kingsmill, Finch. A Pindaric Poem What art thou, Spleen, which everything dost ape? Thou Proteus to abused mankind? who never yet thy real cause could find, or fix thee to remain in one continued shape, still varying thy perplexing form, now a dead sea thou wilt represent, a calm of stupid discontent, then dashing on the rocks wilt rage into a storm. Trembling sometimes thou dost appear, dissolved into a panic fear, on sleep intruding, Dost thy shadows spread thy gloomy terrors round the silent bed, and crowd with boding dreams the melancholy head, 
or when the midnight hour is told, and drooping lids thou still dost waking hold, thy fond delusions cheat the eyes, before them antic spectres dance, unusual fires, their pointed heads advance, and airy phantoms rise. Such was the monstrous vision, seen when Brutus, now beneath his cares oppressed, and all Rome's fortunes rolling in his breast, before Philippi's latest field, before his fate did to Octavius lead, was vanquished by the spleen. Falsely, the mortal part we blame of our depressed and ponderous frame, which, till the first degrading sin let thee its dull attendant in, still with the other did comply, nor clog the active soul, disposed to fly, and range the mansions of its native sky, nor whilst in his own heaven he dwelt, whilst man his paradise possessed, his fertile garden in the fragrant east, and all united odours smelt, no armed sweets until thy reign could shock the sense, or in the face a flushed, unhandsome colour place. Now the jonquille overcomes the feeble brain. We faint beneath the aromatic pain, till some offensive scent thy powers appease, and pleasure we resign for short and nauseous ease. In every one thou dost possess, new are thy motions and thy dress. Now in some grove a listening friend thy false suggestions must attend, thy whispered griefs, thy fancied sorrows here, breathed in a sigh and witnessed by a tear, whilst in the light and vulgar crowd thy slaves more clamorous and loud, by laughters, unprovoked, thy influence too confess. In the imperious wife thou vapours art, which from o'erheated passions rise in clouds, to the attractive brain, until descending thence again through the o'ercast and showering eyes upon her husband's softened heart, he, the disputed point, must yield, something resign of the contested field, till lordly man, born to imperial sway, compounds for peace to make that right away, and woman, armed with spleen, do servilely obey. The fool, to imitate the wits, complains of thy pretended fits, and dullness, born with him, would lay upon thy accidental sway, because sometimes thou dost presume into the ablest heads to come, that often men of thoughts refined, impatient of unequal sense, such slow returns, where they so much dispense, retiring from the crowd, are to thy shades inclined. Or me, alas, thou dost too much prevail. I feel thy force, whilst I against thee rail. I feel my verse decay, and my cramped numbers fail. Through thy black jaundice I all objects see, as dark and terrible as thee. My lines decried, and my employment thought an useless folly or presumptuous fault, whilst in the muses' paths I stray, whilst in their groves and by their secret springs my hand delights to trace unusual things, and deviates from the known and common way, nor will in fading silks compose faintly the inimitable rose, fill up an ill-drawn bird, or paint on glass the sovereign's blurred and undistinguished face, the threatening angel, and the speaking ass. Patron, thou art to every gross abuse. The sullen husband's feigned excuse when the ill humour with his wife he spends, and bears recruited wit and spirits to his friends. The son of Bacchus pleads thy power, as to the glass he still repairs, pretends but to remove thy cares, snatch from thy shades one gay and smiling hour, and drown thy kingdom in a purple shower, when the coquette whom every fool admires, would in variety be fair, and changing hastily the scene from light, impertinent, and vain, assumes a soft, a melancholy air, and of her eyes rebates the wandering fires, the careless posture, and the head reclined, the thoughtful and composed face, proclaiming the withdrawn, the absent mind, allows the fop more liberty to gaze, who gently for the tender cause inquires, 
the cause indeed is a defect in sense, yet is the spleen alleged and still the dull pretense. But these are thy fantastic harms, the tricks of thy pernicious stage, which do the weaker sort engage. Worse are the dire effects of thy more powerful charms, by thee, religion, we all know, that should enlighten here below, is veiled in darkness, and perplexed with anxious doubts, with endless scruples vexed, and some restraint implied from each perverted text, whilst touch not, taste not what is freely given, is but thy niggard voice, disgracing bounteous heaven, from speech restrained, by thy deceits abused, to deserts banished, or in cells reclused, mistaken votaries to the powers divine, whilst they a purer sacrifice design, do but the spleen obey, and worship at thy shrine. In vain to chase thee every art we try, in vain all remedies apply, in vain the Indian leaf infuse, or the parched eastern berry bruise, some pass in vain those bounds and nobler liquors use. Now harmony in vain we bring, inspire the flute and touch the string. From harmony no help is had, music but soothes thee, if too sweetly sad, and if too light, but turns thee gaily mad. Though the physician's greatest gains, although his growing wealth he sees, daily increased by ladies' fees, yet dost thou baffle all his studious pains. Not skilful lower thy source could find, or through the well-dissected body trace the secret, the mysterious ways by which thou dost surprise and prey upon the mind. Though in the search, too deep for humane thought, with unsuccessful toil he wrought, till thinking thee to have catched, himself by thee was caught, retained thy prisoner, thy acknowledged slave, and sunk beneath thy chain to a lamented grave. End of poem. Read by Sandra. Section 4 of Health, Disease, and Everything in Between by T.S. Eliot, Anne Kingsmill Finch, Italia. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hysteria by T.S. Eliot. As she laughed, I was aware of becoming involved in her laughter and being part of it, until her teeth were only accidental stars with a talent for squad drill. I was drawn in by short gasps, inhaled at each momentary recovery, lost finally in the dark caverns of her throat, bruised by the ripple of unseen muscles. An elderly waiter with trembling hands was hurriedly spreading a pink and white checked cloth over the rusty green iron table, saying, If the lady and gentleman wish to take their tea in the garden, if the lady and gentleman wish to take their tea in the garden, I decided that if the shaking of her breasts could be stopped, some of the fragments of the afternoon might be collected, and I concentrated my attention with careful subtlety to this end. End of poem. Read by Sandra. Section 5 of Health, Disease, and Everything in Between by T.S. Eliot and Kingsmill Finch at Alia. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Opium Eater by Mary Eliza Perrin Tucker Before Taking a Dose Life's pathway to me is dreary. I am ill and cold and weary. Would my lonely walk were done and my heavenly race begun. Once all things to me were bright, things that now seem dark as night. Is the darkness all within, dark without, from inward sin? The present dark, eyes dim with age, can see no joy save memory's page. The present, future, ne'er can be bright as the past they once did see. My hair is turning quite grey now, I see some wrinkles on my brow. My teeth, they must be failing too, and corns are growing in my shoe. 
I muffle up my aching face and pray from pangs a moment's grace. Ah, now the misery seeks my head. Would I were with a pangless dead. There's a cure for pain and grief. Come, opium, come to my relief. Soothed by thy influence, I shall find a moment's rest and peace of mind. After taking a dose. Ah, now I sit in bowers of bliss, Soothed by an angel's balmy kiss. Delicious languor o'er me stealing Is now my only sense of feeling. The breath of flowers perfumes the air, And forms around are, oh, so fair. The once cold air seems warm and bright, And I, too, seem a being of light. My hair is not so very grey, some dye will take that hue away. A little powder shall, I vow, hide the small wrinkles on my brow. My teeth are sound, I feel no pain, their slight ache was but sign of rain. And then the twinging of my feet was nothing but a dream, a cheat. To me, the night, though dark, seems day, colored by hope's most beauteous ray. No sorrow hence shall give me pain. I know I'll never weep again. End of poem. Read by Sandra. Section 6 of Health, Disease, and Everything in Between by T.S. Eliot and Kingsmill Finch et Alia. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Plague by Christina Georgina Rossetti Listen, the last stroke of death's noon has struck. The plague is come, a gnashing madman said, and laid him down straightway upon his bed. His writhed hands did at the linen pluck, then all is over. With a careless chuck among his fellows he is cast. How sped his spirit! matters little. Many dead make men hard-hearted. Place him on the truck, go forth into the burial ground, and find room at so much a pitfall for so many. One thing is to be done, one thing is clear. Keep thou back from the hot, unwholesome wind, that it infect not thee. Say, is there any who mourneth for the multitude dead here? August 1848 End of poem. Read by Sandra. Section 7 of Health, Sickness, and Everything in Between by T.S. Eliot and Kingsmill Finch et Alia. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mowers by Charles Mackay. An Anticipation of the Cholera. 1848. Dense on the stream the vapours lay, thick as wool on the cold highway. Spongy and dim, each lonely lamp shone o'er the streets so dull and damp. The moonbeam could not pierce the cloud that swathed the city like a shroud. There stood three shapes on the bridge, alone, three figures by the coping stone, gaunt and tall and undefined, Spectres, built of mist and wind, changing ever in form and height, but black and palpable to sight. This is a city fair to see, whispered one of the fearful three, a mighty tribute it pays to me, into its river, winding slow, thick and foul from shore to shore, the vessels come, the vessels go, and teeming lands their riches pour, it spreads beneath the murky sky a wilderness of masonry, huge, unshapely, overgrown, dingy brick and blackened stone. Mammon is its chief and lord, monarch slavishly adored. Mammon, sitting side by side with pomp and luxury and pride, who call his large dominion theirs, nor dream a portion is despair's. Countless thousands bend to me in rags and purple, 
in hovel and hall, and pay the tax of misery with tears and blood and spoken gall. Whenever they cry for aid to die, I give them courage to dare the worst, and leave their ban on a world accursed. I show them the river so black and deep, they take the plunge, they sink to sleep. I show them poison, I show them rope, they rush to death without a hope. Poison and rope and pistol ball, welcome either, welcome all. I am the lord of the teeming town, I mow them down, I mow them down. I, thou art great, but greater I, the second spectre made reply. Thou rulest with a frown austere, thy name is synonym of fear. But I, despotic and hard as thou, have a laughing lip, an open brow. I build a temple in every lane. I have a palace in every street, and the victims throng to the doors amain, and wallow like swine beneath my feet. To me the strong man gives his health, the wise man reason, the rich man wealth, maids their virtue, youth its charms, and mothers the children in their arms. Thou art a slayer of mortal men, thou of the unit, I of the ten. Great thou art, but greater I, to decimate humanity. Tis I am the lord of the teeming town, I mow them down, I mow them down. Vain boasters to exult at death, the third replied, so feebly done. I ope my jaws, and with a breath slay thousands, while you think of one. All the blood that Caesar spilled, all that Alexander drew, all the hosts by glory killed, from Agincourt court to Waterloo, compared with those whom I have slain, are but a river to the main. I brew disease in stagnant pools, and wandering here, disporting there, favoured much by knaves and fools, I poison streams, I taint the air, I shake from my locks the spreading pest, I keep the typhus at my behest, in filth and slime I crawl, I climb, I find the workman at his trade, I blow on his lips, and down he lies. I look in the face of the ruddiest maid, and straight the fire forsakes her eyes. She droops, she sickens, and she dies. I stint the growth of babes, nude-born, or shear them off like standing corn. I rob the sunshine of its glow, I poison all the winds that blow. Whenever they pass, they suck my breath, and freight their wings with certain death. Tis I am the lord of the crowded town. I mow them down, I mow them down. But, great as we are, there cometh one greater than you, greater than I, to aid the deeds that shall be done, to end the work that we've begun, and thin this thick humanity. I see his footmarks, east and west, I hear his tread in the silence fall. He shall not sleep, he shall not rest, he comes to aid us one and all. Were men as wise as men might be, they would not work for you, for me, for him that cometh over the sea. But they will not heed the warning voice. The cholera comes. Rejoice, rejoice. He shall be lord of the swarming town, and mow them down, and mow them down. End of poem. Read by Sandra. Section 8 of Health, Disease, and Everything in Between by T.S. Eliot and Kingsmill Finch at Analia. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Surgeon's Warning by Robert Southey. The subject of this parody was suggested by a friend to whom also I am indebted for some of the stanzas respecting the patent coffins herein mentioned after the manner of Catholic poets who confess the actions they attribute to their saints and deity to be but fiction, I hereby declare that it is by no means my design to depreciate that useful invention, and all persons to whom this ballad shall come are requested to take notice that nothing herein asserted concerning the aforesaid coffins is true, except that the maker and patentee lives by St. Martin's Lane. The doctor whispered to the nurse, and the surgeon knew what he said, and he grew pale at the doctor's tale and trembled in his sick bed. 
Now fetch me my brethren and fetch them with speed, the surgeon affrighted said. The parson and the undertaker, let them hasten, or I shall be dead. The parson and the undertaker, they hastily came complying, and the surgeon's prentices ran upstairs when they heard that their master was dying. The prentices all, they entered the room, by one, by two, by three. With a sly grin came Joseph in, first of the company. The surgeon swore as they entered his door. "'Twas fearful his oaths to hear. "'Now send these scoundrels out of my sight. "'I beseech ye, my brethren dear.' "'He foamed at the mouth with the rage he felt, "'and he wrinkled his black eyebrow. "'That rascal Joe would be at me. "'I know, but sounds let him spare me now.' "'Then out they sent the prentices. "'The fit, it left him weak.' He looked at his brothers with ghastly eyes and faintly struggled to speak. All kinds of carcasses I have cut up, and now my turn will be. But brothers, I took care of you, so pray take care of me. I have made candles of dead men's fat. The sextons have been my slaves. I have bottled babes unborn and dried hearts and livers from rifled graves and my prentices now will surely come and carve me bone from bone, and I, who have rifled the dead man's grave, shall never have rest in my own. Bury me in lead when I am dead, my brethren I entreat, and see the coffin weighed, I beg, lest the plumber should be a cheat. And let it be soldered closely down, strong and strong can be, I implore, and put it in a patent coffin that I may rise no more. And if they carry me off in the patent coffin, their labour will be in vain. Let the undertaker see it bought of the maker who lives by St. Martin's Lane. And bury me in my brother's church, for that will safer be. And I implore, lock the church door, and pray take care of the key. And all night long let three stout men the vestry watch within. To each man give a gallon of beer and a keg of Holland's gin, powder and ball and blunderbuss, to save me if he can, and eke five guineas if he shoot a resurrection man. And let them watch me for three weeks, my wretched corpse to save, for then I think that I may stink enough to rest in my grave. The surgeon laid him down in his bed, his eyes grew deadly dim. Short came his breath, and the struggle of death did loosen every limb. They put him in lead when he was dead, and with precaution meet first they the leaden coffin way lest the plumber should be a cheat. They had it soldered closely down and examined it o'er and o'er, and they put it in a patent coffin that he might rise no more. For to carry him off in a patent coffin would, they thought, be but labour in vain. So the undertaker saw it bought of the maker who lives by St. Martin's Lane. In his brother's church they buried him, that safer he might be. They locked the door and would not trust the sexton with the key and three men in the vestry watch, to save him if they can, and should he come there to shoot, they swear, a resurrection man. And the first night, by lantern light, through the churchyard as they went, a guinea of gold the sexton showed that Mr. Joseph sent. But conscience was tough. It was not enough, and their honesty never swerved, and they bade him go with Master Joe to the devil as he deserved. So all night long by the vestry fire they quaffed their gin and ale, and they did drink, as you may think, and told full many a tale. The cock, he crew, cock a -loo. past five, the watchman said, and they went away, for while it was day they might safely leave the dead. The second night by lantern light through the churchyard as they went, he whispered anew, and showed them too that Mr. Joseph sent. The guineas were bright, and attracted at their sight, they looked so heavy and new, and their fingers itched as they were bewitched, and they knew not what to do. But they wavered not long, for conscience was strong, and they thought they might get more, and they refused the gold, but not so rudely as before. So all night long by the vestry fire they quaffed their gin and ale, and they did drink, as you may think, and told full many a tale. The third night, as by lantern light through the churchyard they went, he bade them see and showed them three that Mr. Joseph sent. They looked askance with greedy glance, the guineas they shone bright, 
for the sexton on the yellow gold let fall his lantern light, and he looked sly with his roguish eye and gave a well-timed wink, and they could not stand the sound in his hand, for he made the guineas chink, and conscience late that had such weight all in a moment fails, for well they knew that it was true a dead man tells no tales, and they gave all their powder and ball and took the gold so bright and they drank their beer and made good cheer till now it was midnight then though the key of the church door was left with the parson his brother it opened at the sexton's touch because he had another and in they go with that villain joe to fetch the body by night and all the church looked dismally by his dark lantern light they laid the pickaxe to the stones and they moved them soon asunder. They shoveled away the hard-pressed clay and came to the coffin under. They burst the patent coffin first and they cut through the lead. And they laughed aloud when they saw the shroud because they had got at the dead. And they allowed the sexton the shroud and they put the coffin back and nose and knees they then did squeeze the surgeon in a sack. The watchman as they passed along full four yards off could smell and a curse bestowed upon the load so disagreeable so they carried the sack a pick a back and they carved him bone from bone but what became of the surgeon's soul was never to mortal known westbury seventeen ninety eight end of poem read by sandra Section 9 of Health, Disease, and Everything in Between by T. S. Eliot and Kingsmill Finch, Adalia. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Apollinax by T. S. Eliot. When Mr. Apollinax visited the United States, his laughter tinkled among the teacups. I thought of Fragilion, that shy figure among the birch trees, and of Priapus in the shrubbery, gaping at the lady in the swing, in the palace of Mrs. Flaccus at Professor Channing Cheetah's, he laughed like an irresponsible fetus. His laughter was submarine and profound, like the old man of the seas, hidden under coral islands where worried bodies of drowned men drift down in the green silence, dropping from fingers of surf. I looked for the head of Mr. Apollinax, rolling under a chair or grinning over a screen with seaweed in its hair. I heard the beat of centaur's hoofs over the hard turf as his dry and passionate talk devoured the afternoon. He's a charming man, but after all, what did he mean? His pointed ears, he must be unbalanced. There was something he said that I might have challenged, of Dowager Mrs. Flaccus and Professor and Mrs. Cheetah, I remember a slice of lemon and a bitten macaroon. End of poem. Read by Sandra. Section 10 of Health, Disease, and Everything Between this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Health, Disease, and Everything in Between by T.S. Eliot and Kingsmill Finch et Alia. Health, or Yarkus and His Rings by Charles Mackay. The clamorous people throng about my porch to purchase rings, which they believe I weld in holy fire and steep in essences, and permeate with virtuous healing powers, known but to gods in heaven and me on earth. I cannot cure them of their ignorance, but twine it into knowledge of mine own for their behoof. I smile and give them rings and good advice. The advice restores the sick if duly followed, but the rings alone receive the praises of the multitude that loves to be deceived adores a lie, dotes on the incredible, and scorns the truth. But you, my sons, know better. Lo, the rings, 
the five gold rings that worn with trusting faith preserve the freshness and the flower of youth better than balsam or medicament that chiron ever plucked or hermes knew three for the left hand for the body's health two for the right for healing of the soul learn ye their attributes and faculties and teach them to the crowd so shall ye be as i have been the ministers of hope the kind physicians the unfailing friends of wayworn men who've missed the road to health and withered ere their time like smutted corn who wears the first must keep his body pure from toe to crown by daily dalliance with cleansing waters heaven's most precious gift a duty and a luxury both in one who wears the second must avoid excess in every appetite in food and drink in passion in desire in toil in sleep who wears the third must train himself to use all faculties the bounteous gods bestow must teach his eyes to see his ears to hear his hands to toil his feet to run and leap his lungs to breathe the invigorating air must train his head to think his heart to feel and exercise each power of life and limb to full efficiency nor overstretch even by a hair the tension of the string lest it should jar and snap who wears the three shall be a perfect man except in soul a physical noble safe from all but time and accident and chastening of the gods but for the mental health and purity these not suffice the right hand rings must aid the perfect work and crown the king of men who wears the first must love all humankind and feed his spirit with all charities and chaste affections must be faithful friend and joyous comrade must be loving sire and tender husband must with filial care cherish the old the suffering and the poor and so comport himself that men shall say in evil times when griefs oppress the state this is the model of a citizen whose hand shall aid or guide the commonwealth whose patriotic heart and fruitful brain shall goad to action and inspire success who wears the second must with humble heart and fervent faith commend himself to god god of all gods creator of the world who gave the universe its shape and law and makes obedience its own recompense crime its own penalty and needs no praise of idle words being most glorified by labour and submission to his laws the melodies and harmonies of time and choral anthem of eternity who wears these earthly yet most heavenly rings pure without taint or dross and duly serves the invisible spirits that within them dwell needs no physician more the golden age departed from the world revives in him and all the physics and the essences the earth affords are futile to exalt his good to betterness and when at last death lays his finger on that honoured head he lays it gently like a tender friend that would console and cheer life's heavenly flame freed by the touch mounts cheerily to its source made one with god for ever and ever more end of poem read by sandra twenty twenty two Section 11 of Health, Sickness, and Everything in Between. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gerontian by T. S. Eliot. Thou hast nor youth nor age, but as it were an after dinner sleep, dreaming of both. Here I am, an old man in a dry month, being read to by a boy, waiting for rain. I was neither at the hot gates, nor fought in the warm rain, nor knee-deep in the salt marsh, heaving a cutlass, bitten by flies, fought. My house is a decayed house, and the Jew squats on the window-sill, the owner, spawned in some estaminet of Antwerp, blistered in Brussels, patched and peeled in London. The goat coughs at night in the field overhead, rocks, moss, stone-crop, iron, merds. 
The woman keeps the kitchen, makes tea, sneezes at evening, poking the peevish gutter. I, an old man, a dull head among windy spaces. Signs are taken for wonders. We would see a sign, the word within a word, unable to speak a word, swaddled with darkness. In the juvescence of the year came Christ, the tiger. In depraved May, dogwood and chestnut, flowering Judas, to be eaten, to be divided, to be drunk among whispers, by Mr. Silvero, with caressing hands, at Limoges, who walked all night in the next room, by Hakagawa, bowing among the Titians, by Madame de Tornquist, in the dark room, shifting the candles, Fräulein von Kulp, who turned in the hall, one hand on the door. Vacant shuttles weave the wind. I have no ghosts. An old man in a draughty house, under a windy knob. After such knowledge, what forgiveness? Think now. History has many cunning passages, contrived corridors and issues, deceives with whispering ambitions, guides us by vanities. Think now. She gives when our attention is distracted, and what she gives, gives with such supple confusions that the giving famishes the craving, gives too late what's not believed in or if still believed in memory only, reconsidered passion, gives too soon into weak hands what's thought can be dispensed with, till the refusal propagates a fear. Think Neither fear nor courage saves us. Unnatural vices are fathered by our heroism. Virtues are forced upon us by our impudent crimes. These tears are shaken from the wrath-bearing tree. The tiger springs in the new year. Us he devours. Think at last. We have not reached conclusion when I stiffen in a rented house Think at last I have not made this show purposelessly, and it is not by any concitation of the backward devils. I would meet you upon this honestly. I that was near your heart was removed therefrom to lose beauty in terror, terror in inquisition. I have lost my passion. Why should I need to keep it, since what is kept must be adulterated? I have lost my sight. Smell, hearing, taste, and touch. How should I use it for your closer contact? These, with a thousand small deliberations, protract the profit of their chilled delirium, excite the membrane when the sense has cooled with pungent sauces, multiply variety in a wilderness of mirrors. What will the spider do? Suspend its operations? Will the weevil delay? De Bayash, Fresca, Mrs. Camel, whirled beyond the circuit of the shuddering bear in fractured atoms, gull against the wind, in the windy straits of Belle Isle, or running on the horn, white feathers in the snow, the gulf claims, and an old man driven by the trades to a sleepy corner, tenants of the house, Thoughts of a dry brain in a dry season. End of poem. Read by Sandra. 2022. Section 12 of Health, Sickness, and Everything Between. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Inquiry After Peace by Anne Kingsmill Finch. Countess of Winchelsea, a fragment. Peace, where art thou to be found? Where, in all the spacious round, may thy footsteps be pursued? Where may thy calm seats be viewed? On some mountain dost thou lie, serenely near the ambient sky, smiling at the clouds below, where rough storms and tempests grow? Or in some retired plain, undisturbed, dost thou remain, Where no angry whirlwinds pass, 
where no floods oppress the grass. High above or deep below, fain I thy retreat would know. Fain I thee alone would find, balm to my o'er-wearied mind, since what here the world enjoys, or our passions most employs, peace opposes or destroys. Pleasure's a tumultuous thing, busy still and still on wing, flying swift from place to place, darting from each beauteous face, from each strongly mingled bowl, through the inflamed and restless soul. Sovereign power, who fondly craves but himself to pomp in slaves, stands the envy of mankind. Peace in vain attempts to find. Thirst of wealth no quiet knows, but near the deathbed fiercer grows, wounding men with secret stings, for evils it on others brings. War, who not discreetly shuns thorough life, the gauntlet runs. Swords and pikes and waves and flames, each their stroke against him aims. Love, if such a thing there be, is all despair or ecstasy. Poetry's the feverish fit, the overflowing of unbounded wit. And so on. End of fragment. Read by Sandra, 2022.